Hello and welcome to our March third party roundup webinar with Six Sense. Today, we have our industry expert, John Cassell, here to give us an inside look on the newest third party patching release. If you have any questions, please add them to the chat and John will reach out after to answer those. And with that, John Cassell. Hi, everyone, and thank you for attending. Today, I'll be covering some of the most popular third-party products that have received updates since the start of the month. And there have been a number of security bulletins and advisories uh, in March. One thing as well about third-party updates, we have no idea when they'll actually be provided by vendors. Most manufacturers actually have no guaranteed release cadence to rely on. However, Microsoft has been using the second Tuesday of the month for well over a decade now, and some manufacturers have actually followed suit such as Adobe, and we will be covering Adobe today. Before we start, let's briefly discuss what a vulnerability is versus uh, what a patch um, or an update does. A vulnerability is a bug or misconfiguration in a product, application, or an operating system that, if exploited, allows that product or system to be compromised by an attacker. A patch or an update is instead a piece of software or code published by the vendor of that product or system to resolve the vulnerability. With that being said, not all vulnerabilities can be patched and not all patches resolve vulnerabilities. If a vulnerability exists in a product or a system but no patch or workaround is available, then the vulnerability is considered a zero day exploit. And before we get into the latest updates since the year started, how do we prioritize them? There are multiple strategies out there, but here at Sixth Sense, we focus on six different factors. The first is going to be vendor severity. This typically ranges from critical severity to non-applicable uh, and comes directly from the manufacturer of that update. And it may be an update or it could just simply be an advisory that a manufacturer uh, sends out. So it's not always just about patching. Uh, it can also just simply be about uh, countermeasures or other advisories, again, if it's a zero day until additional details are provided or disclosed. It is imp always important uh, to check the vendor severity of any updates. However, do bear in mind that it can clearly be a biased rating. Many third-party updates don't receive severities from their manufacturers as it would obviously highlight that product uh, or application in a negative light. To combat this, we instead prioritize the industry severity more, such as the CVSS score or the Common Vulnerability Scoring System calculated by an independent organization, such as NIST. This score ranges simply from 0 to 10, with 10 being the most severe and critical. The higher the rating typically entails higher possibility of exploitation. And there are a number of factors that, of course, are taken into account uh, for this independent rating, um, which will affect the score. Then we deal with the state of the vulnerability, such as weaponization. This means if it's actively being exploited in the wild and can affect any individual or environment at this exact moment by sophisticated attacks. When vulnerabilities become publicly disclosed, it means that the structure or the blueprint of the bug has been exposed to the industry. This doesn't necessarily mean that it's currently being exploited, but that the details are out there on how to weaponize it. These are typically published by bug bounty programs, independent researchers, or sometimes the manufacturer. If you ever attend a security conference, it's possible that it will be disclosed at that conference, uh, in which case it may not have been discussed previously. Countermeasures are also a possibility and are provided in two ways, either a mitigation, such as a configuration from an antivirus or an EDR type tool that is stopping the vulnerability in its tracks without urgently deploying a patch, uh, uh, greatly affecting the structure of that application. The other countermeasure is a workaround, such as a registry policy or service configuration change that also prevents the vulnerability from being exploited. A great example of this is when Microsoft uh, provides a recommended policy or registry change without the need to actually deploy an out-of-band update. Finally, the sixth factor is uh, in determining our strategy is the exposure, and this breakdown is based on what tool or solution is being used to detect and report on uh, outstanding vulnerabilities across the device fleet, such as a solution like Sixth Sense. Every environment is different and typically includes various versions of operating systems. Knowing where said vulnerabilities exist allow us to better target our endpoints for remediation. Okay, so 
The third party products we'll be discussing today have all received updates since the month started, as mentioned previously, and all resolve some sort of vulnerability. Some are going to be optional, but the main focus here is for security, as well as there are some zero day exploits to discuss. Also, all products mentioned have advisories from the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency to update as soon as possible. First, Adobe dropped a number of updates across various products. Adobe issued advisories across eight separate product lines between Windows, Mac OS, and even some cloud services. These products include Adobe Commerce, Experience Manager, Illustrator, Dimension, Creative Cloud, Photoshop, Substance 3D Stager, and Cold Fusion. Among all products, Adobe resolved an astounding 106 separate vulnerabilities, with most unfortunately being critical in nature. First, Adobe Commerce, formerly known as Magento, received updates to resolve four separate vulnerabilities, with one uh, getting a CBSS score of 7.5 and related to XML injection, and if exploited, could lead to arbitrary file system read. Three other vulnerabilities have lower medium severity ratings, but could uh, still lead to arbitrary code execution or security feature bypass. It's also worth noting um, that Adobe does provide a priority rating along with those security bulletins, and Commerce received a typical priority rating of three. Since a lower Adobe uh, priority rating is more concerning, which is kind of the opposite of CVSS, this means that Commerce, according to Adobe, is not at elevated risk of being exploited. Typically, Adobe stamps their product updates with a priority of three, with a lesser chance of being exploited. And fortunately, seven of the eight products discussed today have priority ratings of three. Next up, and certainly not to be overlooked, uh, Adobe Experience Manager uh, received updates across its, across its relevant platforms to resolve 18 separate bugs, all rated with medium severity. Adobe Illustrator resolved five issues with four rated as critical, and if exploited, could lead to arbitrary code execution. Adobe Dimension received an ast astonishing 58 separate fixes with 40 rated as critical, and if exploited, could lead to arbitrary code execution or me uh, memory leak. This is one of the largest list of fixes I've seen from Adobe in the past four years, and I've been doing uh, research, uh, in the past four years that I've been doing research, and if you happen to be using Adobe Dimension, you're going to want to uh, make sure that that's up to date right now. Uh, and even though it fixed 58 issues, the product still has a vendor severity or priority rather of three. Uh, don't let that fool you, of course, the a number of uh, critical severity issues. And of course, many of them having a higher CVSS score, it should still be prioritized, even though the vendor is uh, kind of lessening that score. Adobe Creative Cloud got one fix rated as critical, but with a CVSS score of 8.6, that's near critical on the CVSS scale, that is, and related to uh, untrusted search path, Adobe Substance 3D Stager addressed 16 separate bugs with 12 being critical in nature. And if exploited, and you know I'm gonna say it, could lead to arbitrary code execution. Uh, the very popular Adobe Photoshop uh, solved one critical use after free issue on Windows and Mac OS platforms. Uh, and that leaves us with the last most concerning product, Adobe Cold Fusion. Uh, Cold Fusion received an advisory for three bugs, with two being critical in nature, and one of those criticals being exploited in the wild. So this is the first zero day that we'll be discussing today. This zero day is related to improper access control, and if exploited, could lead to arbitrary code execution. It has a CVSS score of 8.6, again, near critical on the CVSS score if we classify it. Uh, I would still classify 8.6 in the high uh, area, but um, we're going to um, go with Adobe's rating of critical. And Adobe stated that they're aware uh, that CVE 2023-26360 has been exploited in the wild in very limited attacks targeting the product. However, no other details on the compromises were provided, of course, uh, probably, of course, to protect the public. This is also a rarity in which Adobe provided a vendor severity rating of 1.0, uh, which is the highest rating for them and means that if you're using cold fusion uh, you should update immediately uh, given that some products uh, of course with adobe have had either a zero day exploit like cold fusion or of course all the multiple um, critical advisories which is nearly half the list over half the list actually 
over half the list for Adobe's uh, advisories. The fixes on all Adobe products uh, should not be overlooked and all Adobe users should prioritize patching immediately. Next up, we have Google Chrome. Most, of course, are using this uh, product, most in the industry, I would say, as well as end users uh, individually in the consumer space. It has had three desktop releases for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux since last month. The first update dropped on March 7th and brought the browser to Chrome version 111. This update resolved 40 documented security flaws, with 24 of them being reported by external researchers. Eight of these are reported as high severity and relate to type confusion in the V8 JavaScript engine, as well as in CSS. Stack and heat buffer overflow issues also exist and use after free uh, issues. Lesser fixes include heat buffer overflow and multiple inappropriate implementation and insufficient policy enforcement issues. So far, Google has also forked out a whopping $102,000 in bounties, uh, that's USD by the way, for the 24 disclosed vulnerabilities. The next uh, release was on March 21st. Chrome received another update with eight flaws, seven of which actually were again found by external researchers. Uh, usually I see a much smaller list there, um, many fixes, but a smaller set. Uh, this of course is mainly provided by the bug bounty program. Um, the total payout in this version uh, wasn't as crazy uh, with Google only paying $25,000 USD so far, uh, since two of the fixes haven't actually received any monetary figure just yet. We might actually also see the $102,000 uh, forked out at the beginning of the month actually get raised as they have not determined those figures yet. Of the seven documented fixes for the version on the 21st, all were given high severity ratings and include fixes for out of bounds memory access, out of bounds read, and multiple use after free issues. Six of the other flaws were also marked as high severity. The last version of Chrome was actually just dropped last night, um, but hasn't highlighted any security fixes at this time. So you'll see on the slide, the 27th highlight, but nothing on the right that we would have to prioritize. And of course, this is according to Google Chrome's release notes page. However, given uh, again, that multiple high severity flaws were reported this month, um, and that there's a brand new version with little disclosed of just yet since yesterday, I'd strongly recommend to all users to still make sure that Chrome is updated as soon as possible. Uh, I do mention this often. Worth noting that in 2021, Google Chrome had 16 zero day exploits. In 2022, it had nine zero days. And so far this year, we are still actually looking healthy. I was expecting to have some new news on this uh, webcast for this month, but fortunately nothing. Doesn't mean that we shouldn't prioritize. There's still plenty of fixes there, still plenty of vulnerabilities, but no zero day to highlight. I always mention as well that Chrome is by far the most popular web browser. And uh, and again, across uh, businesses as well as consumers. And it makes, uh, makes it a malicious attacker's preferred target. Regarding updating Chrome, as always, the browser should auto update for any uh, consumers, but administrators, if you have your devices locked down, you should be sure to double check and update accordingly, especially if those end users do not have administrative rights to their devices. Following suit, any vulnerabilities resolved in Chrome also affect other Chromium-based browsers, such as the very popular Microsoft Edge, which you might see, of course, that market share change. It's already changed since they released it, um, but still many are using, of course, Chrome as well as Edge. Edge received eight updates since the month started with two releases addressing Sorry, two releases addressing the same edge specific vulnerabilities. The March 3rd and 9th releases uh, didn't disclose much information. However, the March 13th update of Edge introduced, to quote them, several new features and improvements aimed at enhancing productivity, convenience, and the end user experience. And that's with the new Edge sidebar, according to Edge's again release notes. This includes the new Discover. Um, leveraging uh, Edge Copilot to provide, quote, intelligent suggestions and insights based on the context of the web page and the user's goals, enhanced sidebar visibility with auto hide uh, functionality, and evolved uh, sidebar interaction with, again, quote, new hover functionality that lets users open the sidebar by hovering on the Bing icon in the toolbar. If that seems appealing to you, 
cool, again, cool features uh, within that uh, version upgrade. I should mention as well that admins retain the ability to still control and customize that sidebar. So if you don't like it, you can remove it as needed with uh, additional settings, as well as there are three new policies to empower administrators with uh, the March 13th uh, release. Moving forward, the March 15th release included fixes for various bugs and performance issues. The March 16th release added two new policies related to Adobe Acrobat subscriptions and the March 21st release, again, including fixes and performance enhancements. The other big updates were Edge's uh, March 23rd and 24th releases, where two additional Edge-specific vulnerabilities were resolved. That means that there are additional vulnerabilities on top of the Chromium uh, project that are specific to Edge, uh, as well as additional sidebar improvements uh, that were added. Uh, and these should, again, benefit end users as well as administrators for better control. The first vulnerability uh, resolved within Edge specifically is tracked as CVE 2023-28261 and is related to elevation of privilege with a medium CVSS score of 6.1. The other vulnerability is tracked to CVE 2023-28286 related to security feature bypass uh, and has a similar CVSS score of 6.1. Fortunately, Microsoft mentioned on their website that both of these flaws are less likely to be exploited and would require the user to have to click on a specially crafted URL to be compromised by the attacker. Of course, with any browser, as an administrator, do make sure that uh, you are providing ac um, applicable training to end users, the trust, of course, what they're clicking on. It's one of the main, um, of course, uh, ways that a device can be compromised, as well as the end user. The end user is technically the very first and highest vulnerability, so make sure that they are all, all protected and they have adequate technical training. Also, given that some edge-specific vulnerabilities are present, and all of the Chromium high severity fixes still apply here, I do strongly recommend still to prioritize the newest versions of Edge. Edge as well should update itself, but make sure that it is prioritized. And as well, if you have a tool or solution to check that, uh, that you are assessing. Zilla Firefox released only two updates since last month, including an additional update for extended support release users. Mozilla first dropped a Firefox update on March 14th, bringing Firefox to version 111 and included seven high severity fixes out of a total of 13 CVEs. Three of these high severity fixes are specific to Android, so it won't affect the desktop users. But if you have Android and you like Firefox, do make sure you're also updating. Uh, don't skip those updates. But others include potential cache leak, incorrect code generation and memory safety bugs across the stable as well as the extended channel. In a blog post, um, in my findings, Sophos actually highlighted two of those CVEs for Firefox tracked as CVE 2023-28161 and CVE 2023-28163. And other cybersecurity agencies in Canada and the US have informed users about the latest Firefox patches urging them to read those advisories and apply the necessary updates. And I, those findings were found on Security Week's website. This version also now allows, or offers rather, support for Windows native notifications and improvements for Firefox Relay users. If you happen to be using Relay, do make sure that uh, you are logged in uh, to your Firefox account. Of the 19 issues, 10 are considered high severity and resolve content security policy leak, screen hijacking, arbitrary memory rights, as well as, of course, the typical safety bugs, which we see in pretty much every version of Firefox. Although not as popular as Chrome, obviously, to exploit, but given the higher level of visibility within uh, with this month's Firefox updates, I definitely recommend updating. I don't get too deep into this particular product, but it does follow suit because it does have the similar framework and code base, of course, the same manufacturer. I'd like to quickly note that Mozilla Thunderbird did receive an update since last month, resolving similar high severity issues with similar and um, similar CVEs of Firefox and providing multiple performance enhancements. Another product that I have not discussed much in the past, but has had an interesting month in the security space. Uh, it's a product that I do uh, actually love to use as well, uh, Veeam. Patches were released earlier this month for Veeam backup and replication, as well as the community edition. 
Uh, it's a very popular backup solution for, of course, virtualized environments. And these, um, um, this advisory uh, was to resolve a severe vulnerability that could lead to exposure of credentials. Tracked as CVE 2023-27532 and having a CVSS severity of 7.5, this bug allows an attacker to obtain a, uh, um, encrypted credentials uh, that are stored in the configuration database. According to the company, successful exploitation of this flaw could provide attackers with access to the backup infrastructure hosts. All Veeam backup and replication versions are impacted by this issue, and patches were included in application versions 12 as well as 11a. However, new deployments installed using ISO images dated February 23rd for version 12 and for, uh, February 27th for version 11 or later are not vulnerable, again, according to Security Week. Veeam also offered a temporary countermeasure and stated, quote, if you use an all-in-one Veeam appliance with no remote backup infrastructure components, you can alternatively block external connections to port TCP 9401 in the backup server firewall as a temporary remediation until the patch is installed. Countermeasures, workarounds uh, are excellent mitigation options, but they're not permanent. So if it's just simply a matter of um, uh, protection as well to maybe not deploy that patch just yet, you can use that option. But again, do prioritize that patch when it is next available or in the next maintenance window, I guess, uh, in which those updates can be applied. Some additional products. Uh, this is more kind of on the optional space and no particular security advisories to highlight but have seen updates since the start of the year, include Amazon Workspaces, Audacity, Bitwarden, Dropbox, FileZilla, Jenkins, Malwarebytes, Notepad++, Opera, RingCentral, Skype, Slack, Snagit, WebEx, Wireshark, and Zoom. I always say this, my monthly reminder to all administrators, please include third-party patching in your patch deployment process. This figure may have changed um, over the past few years. I've been doing this webcast, but uh, last I heard, it's around 20% of all vulnerabilities are in the operating system. Around 75 to 80% are actually in all those applications that you add on it. So if you're only prioritizing your oper operating system patches, especially for security reasons, you're not actually handling a large chunk of what could be considered an exploit. Any and all applications installed can be considered a potential vulnerability. Finally, and very, very unfortunate for Apple users, a number of products were given update advisories just yesterday to resolve various security issues and for specifically iOS and iPadOS version 15, those users, um, those products uh, address an actively uh, exploited zero day vulnerability in WebKit. And that may not be a huge chunk, but it is something of course uh, to think about if you happen to be using an older device. The zero day on iPad, uh, sorry, uh, iOS and iPadOS version 15 devices, which was actually patched last month across other Apple products, is described as a type confusion issue and can be easily exploited for arbitrary code execution by getting the targeted user to access a malicious website. This flaw was reported by an anonymous researcher and it's tracked as CVE 2023-23529. You watched last month's webinar or webcast, uh, you'll hear me say the same CVE, but it was not across this specific product line. It was for others across Mac OS, Safari, um, as well as the newer versions of iPad and iPad OS, or iOS and iPad OS. No additional information still has been disclosed regarding the attacks exploiting the vulnerability as detailed again last month for other Apple products. One of Apple's advisories did thank Citizen Lab at the University of Toronto's Monk School for its assistance. It is unclear if that assistance was related to the zero-day flaw, but if it was, the zero-day may have been exploited in attacks linked to mercenary spyware vendors, whose activities are often detailed uh, by Citizen Lab. Personally, I don't believe the anonymous researcher may be the source, as in this month, the iOS and iPadOS advisory thanks other individuals. Uh, leaving Citizen Lab out of that uh, advisory, but it does still flag that it researcher as anonymous. In addition to the zero-day flaw, Apple's latest macOS update, Ventura 13.3, 
also patches a really large number, 58 unique CVEs, including logic, out-of-bounds read, and memory utilization issues. Mac OS Monterey version 12.6.4 resolved 27 bugs. And Big Sur, being still supported, of course, patched 25 unique bugs. Apple did not mention any potential weaponization in these three products, but given that sheer number of updates, or fixes rather, you should prioritize. Total fixes for all currently supported versions of macOS total 110. That's a huge number. iOS and iPadOS versions 15, uh, version 15.7.4, as well as newer versions 16.4 were patched to resolve a total of 49 unique vulnerabilities. But again, if you happen to be using versions 15, update as soon as possible, because it is actively exploited in the wild. tvOS 16.4. And watchOS 9.4 also received updates to resolve a combined 30 flaws. Safari 16.4 and macOS Big Sur and oh, sorry, for macOS Big Sur and Monterey was patched for two WebKit vulnerabilities. And interestingly, one reason I wanted to definitely highlight this today, Studio Display Firmware 16.4, specific to macOS Ventura 13.3 and later, received a separate update, which is rare to resolve a memory corruption issue where an app may be able to execute arbitrary code kernel privileges. This uh, unique vulnerability is tracked as CVE 2023-27965, and Apple thanks Painju Lab for finding it. If you happen to be using the Studio Display, be sure to update the firmware as the operating system will not resolve the exploit. Now, I know Apple doesn't really count as a third-party product. We're back in the operating system space, but I wanted to cover it on this webcast to inform my, my audience, since this advisory addresses a zero-day vulnerability as well as over 100 other security flaws, and of course, across various product lines from Apple. Of course, for any third-party products on Apple devices, you do have that App Store available. Be sure to check it and update accordingly. I hope this information has been informative and useful. If you enjoy uh, the form of this webcast, please contact us and let us know. If you have any further questions, concerns, or suggestions uh, for improvement, we would love to hear it. Thank you for your time and happy patching.